Welcome back to Talk GT's In The Showroom series. I'm Dan Barufo and today I get the opportunity to tell you all about this, the Mazda RX-7 Spirit R. Where to begin with this? Well, for start, it's rare. They only made 1500 Spirit R's. This one is number 1219. And it's in Innocent Blue. I'm not sure why they call it Innocent Blue, because it does look rather naughty, even standing still. Just looking at the design of this car, it is timeless. It's a word that gets banded about too much, but this still looks fresh. The design team responsible for this also we're responsible for the best-selling sports car the last 30 years, the MX-5. Look at the details on it. Everything screams performance, speed. You've got the splitter at the front, unique to this car. Standard RX-7 FD is the side vents letting air out from the high pressure areas in the wheel wells. You have a double bubble roof, reminiscent of the old Zagato race cars. Coming to the back, no 90s Japanese sports car would be complete without a bewinged spoiler on the back. Personally, my opinion, this car better without the spoiler. My opinion, you can hate me all you want. Lots of these RX-7s get modified. This is not the type of car to do that to. This is a limited edition, end of production car. It came out in 2002, this one, and it's only covered 50,000 kilometers. It seems a shame that I can't just jump in it and drive it at the minute, but it's not my car and it's raining outside. Thank you, British autumn time. The spec of this car is spec A. They did three specs, A, B, and C. Now, I'm gonna try and get this right in one go. Type A was carbon Kevlar Recaro bucket seats, no back seats, manual transmission. Type B was red leather interior, red leather trimmed bucket seats with rear seats, manual transmission. And type C was red leather four seater bucket seats with auto transmission. That one actually had less power, but a little bit more mid range torque. Those seats, incidentally, save 10 kilos of weight, which on a pretty lightweight car already adds to that performance. Every little bit of saving. This car was a JDM model only. It wasn't sold in other markets. It was primarily a send off, a thank you, a goodbye, a farewell. And they condensed all of their knowledge that they'd learned over the years since 1993 of building this car into this one model. It got the forged BBS alloys. Again, on the Type A, these were in a, a gunmetal shadow chrome finish, but the Bs and Cs, they were in silver. So you can identify them straight away just on the wheel color. This car is a sum of its components and every single one of those components is designed to make it go faster and handle better. It is a race car for the road. The RX-7, when it came out in 1978, adopted the Wankel rotary engine. Stop sniggering. Stop sniggering. I did not swear. The rotary engine is very special. There's no pistons, there's no valves. It's basically a triangle that goes round in an oval thing. There will be a diagram. Internet is your friend, Wikipedia, whatever as a result of which there are less moving parts. But crucially, it's a very, very compact design. There's only two companies that I can think of at the minute, and I'm probably wrong, but NSU and Mazda, they were the two main proponents of the rotary engine. NSU fell by the wayside, Mazda continued with it. In fact, they even won Le Mans with a rotary engine race car. If you get the chance, find a video, listen to the scream of that engine. The thing about this engine is it is compact. And because it's compact, 
it can be moved all the way back. Here's your front axle line at this point. The engine is behind that front axle line. It's not a big heavy engine. Because of that, the balance of this chassis is perfection. The front end, it grips, it darts around, it's responsive. There's very little understeer because there's no weight pushing forwards. And this one, sequential turbocharged 1.3 or 2.6, depending on how you do it, it's got 280 horsepower. So you're never going to be short of power. And the thing with those sequential turbos is that there's no real lag as such. You've got a smaller turbo giving you boost about 10 PSI from 1800 RPM. So it makes it easier to drive, it's more tractable. The second turbo kicks in at about 4000. There's a little dip on the changeover, but then it goes all the way to the red line, again, maintaining that 10 PSI. So it makes it more tractable. It makes one hell of a noise as well. It's actually a, a lovely, lovely noise, unless you're one of these people that straight pipes rotary engines. Don't do that. Just don't. It's not nice. Stop it. These sound wonderful with a decent system. Straight piped, just makes my ears bleed. Going out for a spirited drive in my R32 GTR and a friend in their FD, straight piped, I couldn't hear myself. I couldn't even hear my car over theirs. This one has got the factory strut brace, obviously stiffens up the chassis. They've got the huge red Mazda four pot calipers up front to bring it all to a stop with the drilled discs. The lower spec models did not have the drilled discs. The automatics, we've got to touch on this because I know they have their place. And I know that if you can't drive a, a manual car through disability or anything like that, then automatics are a godsend. I'm glad this one's not an automatic because I wouldn't feel as attached to it as I am. I, lo I love the fact that cars still, that we can still change gear. I'm not looking forward to the future where there's no manual gearboxes and everything's electric. For me, I think the Nirvana of cars was actually in the 90s because we got rid of a lot of the foibles of the analog era. We got rid of carburetors, we got fuel injection, we got properly developed turbocharger systems, but then we didn't get all the complex electronics that are talking to each other. What you've got here, in essence, is everything that's great about the automotive industry. They've developed this type of engine over years and years and years, even when nobody else was. It's unique in its application. It's a two-seater sports car. And it, it gives this car its identity. It really does. No, and I don't just mean in terms of sound and feel. I mean the way it drives. And not just power delivery, the way it handles is down to this engine because of the weight distribution. I think that they haven't actually produced a better looking car than this. And that's a shame. It's nearly 20 years old now. And yes, the Mazda have produced some good looking cars. But the RX-8, there's not a patch on this. This will be one of the greatest designs of all time. And right now, I just want to take it for a drive. But it's raining, and it's not my car. I'm going to sit in it, though. Come and have a look. This interior is driver-focused. It's more like a fighter jet cockpit than anything. Everything is angled to the driver, a bit like the Mark IV Supra. All your controls are facing you, not the passenger. So if they're going to lean through your stereo, no, get away, get away. It's dominated by these Kevlar bucket seats and you can see the weave on them. It, they're just beautiful, it's a work of art. And they are incredibly, incredibly comfortable. And they serve many purposes. They hold you in position when you're going round corners, which is what this car's made for. And as I've said, they have saved so much weight over the factory seats. And that's always a good thing. Up front, 
the speedo is off to the right. The speedo, how fast you're going, is secondary to what the engine's doing. Like the old race Porsches, your, your taco, your rev counter is slap bang in the middle, clear, precise numbers. Zero is at vertical. It's just pointing straight down and it goes all the way up to nine. And when you start getting up here, the noise, it just fills the cabin. It is intoxicating. Unless you've straight piped it. Stop it. Now, I hurt my back a couple of days back. I persevered getting in here without wincing. I'm going to get out now. This video might go on a little bit longer because these seats are deep. I'm going to crawl out now. Oh God, I'm like I'm nine months pregnant. How can I summarize this car? Japanese Ferrari? I think that's doing it a disservice. I think it's unique in itself that it doesn't have to be compared to other cars of its day. However, if you'd like to see it being compared, check out the video above when you can see it against the nurse back. Two completely different cars, both with the same focus to create an amazing driving experience. This car, however, will stand the test of time. This design, the sleekness of it, the pop-up headlights, it's beautiful. It's one of those cars that you will lose part of your life just looking at it. Every time you lock it, you know, it's not like your standard daily beater. Every time you lock this car or unlock it, you'll just find yourself gazing maybe for a split second, 10 seconds more than you should. But it, over the, your lifetime, it'll all add up to years, years you'll spend looking at that shape. And then there's driving it. An experience like no other because of that engine, because of where it is, the dynamics of the chassis. It's one of the greatest cars ever made. I'll hang my hat on that, and I'm not even a massive fan of rotary engines. But as a complete package, it's rare to find better. I'd love to hear your opinions on this car, so please like and subscribe and comment, and I'll see you next time. If I get enough likes, who knows, Tristan might let me do a video on V-Spec 2. Tris, can I do a video on this? Cheers. See you next time.